to Liam Kerr. As that concludes topical questions. Uh, we're now going to move on to our next item of business, which is a statement by Michael Russell on the response to the latest EU exit vote in Westminster. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, so I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons now, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Presiding Officer, the date at which the UK is scheduled to leave the EU is now just 38 days away. In terms of sitting days for this Parliament, that equates to 18, including today. Yet, Presiding Officer, there is still no resolution of the chaos that prevails at Westminster, no consensus about the way forward, no relief from the incompetence of the current UK government, and still no respect for the decision of this country and this Parliament decisively against Brexit. Indeed, with every day that passes, the unrealistic, irresponsible, and in terms of realizable outcomes, impossible approach of the Prime Minister only serves to heighten uncertainty for communities, citizens, and businesses across Scotland to an intolerable degree, and to increase the risk of a no-deal exit. The well-connected political website reported yesterday that in European capitals, there is now mounting alarm that Theresa May has set Britain on course for a diplomatic disaster. And it said, one minister from a major EU power was left so shocked after a meeting with a UK counterpart last week, they concluded Britain is now hell-bent on pushing the crisis to the wire in the hope of a last-minute concession from EU leaders which will not materialise. Of course, the House of Commons had the opportunity last week to agree to an extension of Article 50 to allow us to avoid the economic damage of a no-deal or hard Brexit outcome. I pay tribute to those MPs who supported that SNP amendment, the, the Liberal Democrats, the Green MP, Plaid Cymru, two Tories, 41 members of the Labour Party. Of the seven Scottish Labour MPs, three walked into the division lobbies to do what Scotland clearly wants. But all the Scottish to Tories opposed it, showing yet again that for a Scottish Tory parliamentarian, there as here, the needs of their fractured and fractious party come a long way before the needs of their suffering country. Presiding officer, this Scottish Government continues to believe that the best outcome for the UK as a whole and for Scotland is to remain within the EU. And that now, given the impasse that exists at Westminster, the best democratic way forward is to give the people the final choice. But we have, over the past two and a half years, been very clear about willingness to compromise, setting out credible and achievable positions in December 2016 and subsequently, which were ignored or summarily dismissed by the UK Government. No doubt at some stage this afternoon, the Tory benches will brazenly insist that the only way to avoid a new deal is to support the Prime Minister's very bad deal. But surely even their certainty in that mantra must have been shaken a little this week, when no four, fewer than 40 senior retired diplomats signed a letter which pointed out just how awful the Prime Minister's deal actually is. Not only would that deal make Scotland poorer, removing us from the European single market, risking a fall in Scotland's working tax-paying population and putting us at a competitive disadvantage to Northern Ireland, it would also, in the words of those very knowledgeable diplomats, result in what they call a brexternity of endless uncertainty about our future for both citizens and businesses alike. And if there was ever to be an end to that brexternity, the best that could be hoped for in a far distant date, given the Prime Minister's red lines, would be some sort of free trade agreement which our modelling indicates would mean that by 2030, our GDP would be around £9 billion lower than if we'd stayed in the EU, equivalent to £1,600 for every person in Scotland. And as things stand, even if the withdrawal agreement was approved by the UK and European parliaments, it's entirely possible, even probable, that no deal will only have been postponed rather than avoided. Such is the chaos that now engulfs Westminster, it's impossible to say with any confidence that the terms of any future trade deal with the EU would finally be approved by MPs. Next week, the House of Commons will again get the opportunity to pass further judgment <coughs> on the Prime Minister's efforts. We will continue to provide a voice for common sense. For presiding officer, a no-deal outcome isn't inevitable. But alas, it is becoming more likely with every day that passes, and every attempt the Prime Minister makes to bludgeon and frighten MPs into accepting her threadbare and damaging plan. So as a responsible government, we must act wherever we can to minimize and mitigate the impacts in Scotland as far as we are able to do so. And in doing so, we must as always be very straight with the people of Scotland. Later this week, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, will publish a paper 
on the likely economic costs and impact of a no-deal Brexit. It is vital that this chamber and Scotland knows that things will change, and change very fast for the worse if a no-deal is forced upon us. For example, a no-deal Brexit could, we estimate, result in an increase in unemployment in Scotland of around 100,000 people, more than doubling the unemployment rate. We would go from a record low to a level not far off that at the depth of the last recession, with all the human costs which that would entail. Whatever we as a government do, and we will do everything we can, we simply could not avoid that sort of damage being done to our economy and our country. But one person could. The Prime Minister could, if she were to immediately agree an extension to Article 50 and rule out with concrete legislative steps any no-deal outcome. Getting such an extension would not be difficult. Indeed, President Juncker said yesterday, any decision to ask for more time lies with the UK. If such a request were to be made, no one in Europe would oppose it. So the only opposition to an extension lies within the House of Commons. The work of the Scottish Government Resilience Committee and the Scottish Resilience Partnership on planning, mitigation and preparing arrangements to respond to the risks and impacts of leaving the EU without a deal is continuing and intensifying, as the First Minister made clear last week after our special Cabinet meeting. The Resilience Committee met in Glasgow last week, its ninth session, prior to that Cabinet meeting and is meeting again tomorrow. I will be in London tomorrow, attending yet another UK Cabinet EU exit subcommittee and seeking firm answers to the many questions which we still have. For example, we do not yet know how much ferry capacity is available or what routes it will exist or exactly what priority goods will be carried. Nor do we know what priority will be accorded to each category of goods, nor what arrangements will be made to service Scottish requirements, including the particular challenges of rurality. We've also not yet heard whether export of foodstuffs can be integrated with special arrangements for import, consolidating inbound and outbound capacity to maximize the benefits. There are many more ben matters on which we need clarity, and we'll continue to seek that, given that such clarity is essential for our preparations. Yet leaving those difficulties aside, it has to be said that although we are working as closely as we can with the UK government, even if there was a perfect information flow, we do not now believe there is the time or the resource to ensure absolutely everything required will be in the most effective place, in the most effective way, by the required dates. That's not a criticism of anyone working very hard on these matters north or south of the border. It's simply a fact of the shortness of the time available and the size of the task to be undertaken. Of course, there are those who seem to be seeking to normalize no deal, or with a profoundly concerning sense of misplaced optimism, who are suggesting that its effects will somehow not be as serious as has been widely predicted. They are utterly wrong. It is clear, and will be made even clearer in the Chief Economic Advisor's paper, which will be published on Thursday, that a no-deal Brexit remains a significant and live risk which would lead to a major dislocation to the Scottish economy. The impact of any shock is likely to vary across sectors as well as regions according to their economic structure, and if prolonged, such a shock could lead to significant structural change in the economy. In addition to this, the uncertainty relating to Brexit is already impacting key economic indicators for Scotland, including consumer confidence and business investment. Let me, however, indicate what we are doing against the clock. Transport Scotland is working with providers and ports and airports in Scotland to assess existing capacity and identify how that capacity could help mitigate disruption to imports and exports. In trade, whilst the UK government is currently negotiating with 40 plus trading partners in an attempt to roll over existing EU third country agreements, there is now no possibility that all or even a majority of those will be in place. Access to some markets will therefore be considerably disrupted. Nonetheless, we are working to secure as consistent and wide-ranging a food supply as possible and to enable improved or new supply chains to ensure they get to every part of the country and to try and overcome barriers to export of food and drink as well. If free movement is curtailed, as seems very likely, this would have serious and immediate consequences in, amongst other sectors, that of health and social care workers. The Scottish Government is absolutely committed to doing all it can to speak up for and to support EU citizens working in those roles and many others at this uncertain and anxious time. We passionately want relatives, friends, neighbours and colleagues who come from other EU countries to stay in Scotland. 
We've already committed £800,000 to Citizens and Advice Scotland to provide advice and support to EU citizens in Scotland affected by changes in the immigration rules as a result of Brexit. And we will shortly intensify our information campaign to encourage EU nationals to stay. Presiding officer, in my statement earlier this month, I urged MSPs to reach out to small businesses and their constituencies and encourage them to seek the information they need on Brexit. It remains of concern that so many small businesses in particular have not yet engaged in sufficient detailed planning and preparation. Undoubtedly, the tendency towards normalcy bias is well established in Scotland. But the UK government is not functioning as a normal government. It may well allow a no deal to come about either by accident or design, contrary to all norms of government. Accordingly, I would today strongly urge all businesses to seek out the information we are providing through our Brexit website at www.mygov.scot or for, the, for that for the Prepare for Brexit campaign, the one-door online approach jointly delivered by Scottish Enterprise, Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Skills Development Scotland, and to do it now, whether you export or not. The Chief Constable, of course, recently announced plans to put 360 officers on standby from mid-March to deal with any incidents that may arise across the country, such as disruption at ports. That is just one more example of an initiative which seeks to align existing financial and staff resources to the challenges we face in order to ensure that we have the right people in the right places with the right skills to respond quickly and effectively. We've been clear that any cost related to EU exit should not have a detrimental impact on Scotland's public finances. And Derek Mackay again raised this matter with the Chief Secretary to the Treasury when they met last week, although no satisfactory response was forthcoming. We're actively pursuing the issue of funding for the consequences of a no-deal outcome with the UK government along with a number of other matters. But it's abundantly clear that, is that if Brexit is going to cost Scotland at every level of government, in every business sector, in every part of the country, far more than the existing consequentials. Finally, presiding officer, let me turn to the important matter of our legislative preparations. To date, only 30 of the 114 UK SIs to which we have consented have actually completed their passage in the UK Parliament. I've made clear my concerns on this matter to the UK Government and have impressed upon them the importance of ensuring that the deficiency fixes to which we have given our consent are actually delivered. We're still on track to process both parts of the programme, UK SI notifications and Scottish SIs, through the Scottish Parliament by the end of March. So our laws should be as ready as they can be for the shock of EU exit. However, the Prime Minister has now indicated that in the event of an agreement being reached, she would intend to push through the Withdrawal Agreement Bill before the 29th of March, as well as a range of other Brexit-related legislation. This could mean passing laws of the profoundest importance with consequence for all the devolution settlements in a few days. This cannot and should not be done. If that bill is presented to this chamber for a legislative consent, the government will recommend that such consent be refused, because both, both because of that impossible timetable and also because the UK government has moved not an inch on the issue of essential changes to the Sewell process. Presiding officer, let me conclude by reiterating the First Minister's message last week. The Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to preparing as best we can and to safeguarding the interests of businesses and communities in Scotland as far as possible. However, the way this has been approached by the Prime Minister is reckless and irresponsible. It is now clear beyond any doubt that the Conservative Party and the UK Conservative Government pose a real danger to Scotland. The only sensible solution now available is a delay to Article 50, a ruling out of a no deal, and a people's vote. We will continue to press for those things with every legislative and political tool and every ounce of energy at our disposal. Thank you very much. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions. Adam Tompkins to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Another week another Mike Russell statement, and another ever more repetitive account of the dangers of a no-deal Brexit, with no recognition whatever of the plain fact, presiding officer, that those who risk a no-deal Brexit are those like Mike Russell and all his SNP colleagues who oppose the Prime Minister's deal. I do wonder, presiding officer, what the point is of Mr Russell's statement. What is he seeking to achieve? What indeed has he achieved in the two and a bit years since he returned to government. His flagship continuity bill, eviscerated by the Supreme Court, 
three or is it now four iterations of Scotland's place in Europe doing nothing but gathering dust at the back of various filing cabinets. And so desperate is this cabinet secretary that today he's reduced to taking his lines from online news sources and websites, casting around to fuel his ongoing addiction to referendums, indeed his ongoing addiction to losing referendums. Meanwhile, presiding officer in the real world, the Prime Minister is working harder than ever both across parties <laughs> and, and with newly independent MPs and with our European partners to ensure that we leave the European Union with a deal. It is manifestly in no one's interests for us to leave without a deal. So when is the SNP going to grow up, quit the grandstanding and work with us to get a withdrawal agreement that we can all support? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I, um, I don't get much time to catch up on, on movies, unfortunately, but I am keen to see soon the Stan and Ollie movie, I have to say. And because in that sort of slapstick comedy, there's always a moment in which one of the protagonists runs head first into a, a, a rake or a ladder or a wall. And that's how I feel about the questions from Adam Tompkins. He just gets up and runs straight into the wall. Because who's responsible for the mess that we're in? Yeah. It is the Prime Minister. Yeah. It is the Conservatives. Yeah. But, who, but who has failed to back that deal? Who has failed to back that deal? The Conservative Party at Westminster. Who was she, she defeated by? Who was she defeated by last week? The Conservative Party at Westminster. So I'm afraid the slapstick from Professor Tompkins is wearing a bit thin. Because the reality of this situation is the only repetitive nature is the flights, the backpacking flights that the Prime Minister takes to Europe again and again to be met with the same answer. The answer that came this morning, I have to say, from the, um, the U European Union uh, spokesperson who said the EU will not reopen the withdrawal agreement. We cannot accept a time limit to the backstop of a unilateral or exit clause. Yet again, I have to say, the Prime Minister will fly to Brussels tomorrow and come back empty-handed. So it is time, it is time for the Conservatives to accept responsibility, both at London and here, and to recognise they are causing this disaster. They could avert it, but we've heard nothing yet from the Tories this afternoon that shows they are conscious of that, and Scotland will judge them harshly for it. Neil Findlay to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, Mr Tompkins says he wonders what the point, of, point is of these statements. I have to say, I wonder what the point is of Adam Tompkins, someone who has gone through years of study, years of education, and that's the kind of statement he gives to Parliament. Utterly pathetic, Mr Tompkins. We've got less than 40 days to go until the UK is supposed to leave the EU, and we still have gridlock. The Prime Minister has desperately tried to bribe her own backbenchers and failed. She's tried to bribe MPs representing former mining communities and failed. And she's tried for the first time to meet trade union leaders. And again, that has failed. Her red lines remain in place and the EU has rejected her wish to throw Ireland under her Brexit bus by reneging on the backstop. And they are right to do so because there must be no return to a hard border. And all the while businesses grow more Nervous workers fear for their jobs and the public grow ever more exasperated. Yesterday's announcement by Honda at Swindon, while not exclusively about Brexit, undoubtedly has a Brexit element to it. The issue of the backstop can be resolved with a permanent customs union. The EU want that, businesses want that, and trade unions want that. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that that should be an immediate priority and that would very likely gain a majority? in the House of Commons. Does he agree that close alignment and working with the single market is the best way to protect jobs and rights and ensure there is no race to the bottom? And that we should continue to work across Europe with agencies and institutions in areas such as research and development, education, environmental protection and our future security. These are clear steps proposed by Labour that could be taken now and I believe build a majority in the UK Parliament and provide certainty for our people. Tory chaos has to come to an end. We've had record defeats in Parliament, fortnightly humilia uh, humiliations and repeated rejection by EU leaders. It's time for the Prime Minister to end this chaos and admit that our Brexit plan has failed and to support Labour's robust and legally binding, legally binding amendment next week that will prevent 
a no deal. And finally, will the Cabinet Secretary update Parliament on what work has been proceeding on common frameworks and on the redrafting of the intergovernmental uh, agreements if the EWB proceeds? And before the Cabinet Secretary replies, can I just, uh, can I, Cabinet Secretary, one second, just before the Cabinet Secretary replies, this is a very robust argument, but could I ask all members to be refrain from being so personal in their political attacks? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I deal with the common frameworks and the intergovernmental issues first? On common frameworks, as he will be aware, the, there was a publication uh, 10 days ago uh, between the UK government and the devolved administration saying that work was continuing and significantly uh, that no Section 12 orders had yet been used. As long as the Section 12 orders are not used, we will continue to work with the UK government on a voluntary basis. But the same proviso exists as has existed in the last two publications. If Section 12 orders are used, we will cease to do so. Uh, uh, on the intergovernmental uh, fr um, uh, relationships, uh, the UK government is still uh, uh, doing nothing. We are trying to bring those forward. We are talking about issues that arise in there, and we're just getting uh, no response. But then they are rather bu busy messing everything else up. So maybe we should keep them away from the intergovernmental relationships for a period of time. Um, on the customs union, can I say that I'm pleased that the Labour Party is now in the position where it recognises the importance of the, the Norway or Norway Plus model, a model not dissimilar to the model that we were talking about in 2016. And to that extent, I'm happy to welcome the customs union issues. But I, I, do, I do think that the customs union on its own does not resolve the issue of Northern Ireland entirely, and that is an issue that would have to be addressed. There's also the issue of freedom of movement within the single market, which is crucial for Scotland, absolutely crucial for Scotland. And, and without uh, freedom of movement, then we will have very considerable problems. But the customs union uh, and the, a proper membership of the customs union, I continue to support, but more is going to be required. What we're getting, however, from the Tories is no movement at all. The red lines, as Mr. Finlay has rightly said, are excluding movement. And until those road, red lines change, we will stay in this impasse. Patrick Harvey to be followed by Willie Rennie. Thank you, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advance copy of the statement. Those of us who support a people's vote are sometimes challenged that if the public are given the chance finally to cancel this mess, there will be a backlash and that it would drive people toward the far right. But isn't it clear that far right sentiment has been cultivated deliberately within the UK over decades of racist uh, rhetoric and policy? Uh, and that far-right sentiments have been deliberately cultivated and unleashed by the Brexit campaign to such an extent that the far-right threat is rising, whatever the consequence of Brexit, whether they use a sense of, of betrayal and defeat or of triumphalism at the end of this process. So what discussions has the Scottish Government uh, had, either within government or with Police Scotland, about the potential for the far-right threat, the ways that we need to tackle it, and the way that we need to oppose the values, the toxic values that underpin it. Well, I think I should ask my, uh, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, to respond in, in terms of detail of Police Scotland and, and, and the justice uh, issues in there. But of course, we would all agree that the rise of the far right and the encouragement of the far right comes not just from active encouragement, but from passive encouragement. And it arises when the EU is misrepresented and when people do not stand up for the virtues of cooperation and working together uh, as sovereign states within the EU. And that is the really crucial issue here. The people's vote will give people a chance, I would hope, to have a reconsideration, not just of what has taken place, but a new consideration of how this issue has developed and been presented over the last two and a half years. And the people who have walked away from their previous support for the EU because they were told to do so by the Prime Minister and the Tory party are hugely culpable, hugely culpable. And we have to recognise that and make that clear to them. Members of the Tory benches here are hugely culpable because not one of them has been prepared to stand up and to say that what is going on is utterly wrong and should not be allowed to continue. And I long for the day when I see a Conservative with the courage to do that in Scotland. Willie Rennie to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Uh, the penultimate sentence of the Minister's statement says the only sensible solution now available is a delay to Article 50, a ruling out of a no deal and a people's vote. I agree wholeheartedly with the Minister. Seven MPs left the Labour Party yesterday because they feel so strongly in part about Europe. So what practical steps is the Minister taking over the next few days and weeks 
to further build support for a people's vote so we can get out of this mess. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I I'm not going to get involved in the private grief of the Labour Party. I I'll, I'll leave that matter to, to others. But I can say that at Westminster, our group has shown itself to be very constructive on these matters. Uh, for example, the amendment, which I acknowledge the Liberal Democrats supported last week, uh, was a very po positive amendment that actually said, let us immediately uh, ensure that there is a, an extension. And indeed, it is obvious now from what one is hearing from uh, the EU that the extension would happen. I've quoted President Juncker on that. All that needs to happen now is that the Conservative government needs to ask for that extension. They may well get an extension beyond three months. That is also quite clear that that atmosphere is changing and some of the fears about uh, question, uh, questioning the legitimacy of the European Parliament if UK representatives were not seated uh, appear to be passing away. So that is there. I am working with our group at Westminster. I'm sure Mr Rennie is working with his group at Westminster to try and ensure that there is a broad support for the people's vote. It would, of course, be transformed if the Labour Party were to wholeheartedly support that, and I wish they would. And I have said that repeatedly in this chamber, constructively, and I go on saying it. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Donald Cameron. Presiding officer, I note with a really heavy heart the Cabinet Secretary's warnings and his statement about the impact on Scotland's unemployment figures. Given what we've seen this past week from job losses to souring trade relations, would the Cabinet Secretary agree that this must act as a wake-up call for all members of this chamber, not least the Tories, about the seriousness of the situation we find ourselves in and the risk posed by Theresa May's approach to Brexit? Cabinet Secretary. I would agree. Unemployment is, is of course, a, a major problem for the economy, but it's also a personal tragedy for every single person who experiences it. And in these, cir these circumstances, we should try everything we can to avoid those personal tragedies. Now, there is a way to do so. An extension of Article 50 would find the first step in which confidence could be restored. But of course, the warning about this matter has been there for a considerable period of time. The Japanese government issued a letter in September 2016 to the UK government, which made it absolutely clear what their attitude was and what the attitude of their companies would be uh, in to Brexit. The Prime Minister chose to ignore that letter. If you now look at that letter, and I read it again last night, if you now look at that letter, you realise that everything the Japanese uh, government did not want to happen has happened, and has been allowed to happen by the Conservatives. It is therefore little wonder that they are now saying, circumstances have changed, we cannot continue with the investments we've had. But widely, businesses are now saying they cannot cope with this. The CBI, the NFU in England today, whole ranges of businesses saying this is impossible to live with. And still, the Conservatives do nothing. And still they pursue the chimera in Brussels with the Prime Minister rushing back across to negotiate something that is not negotiable. And in these circumstances, the Prime Minister needs to wake up, to actually recognise that this is her responsibility. And, and you know, pr first of all, to resign. That would be the most useful yeah. thing she could do. Yeah. But if she's not going to resign, then the next thing she needs to do is to get that extension of Article 50, to make sure that there is a, 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 a circumstance that are put in place so that there can be no deal, and then to have a people's vote, vote, vote. Then she can resign. Donald Cameron to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Uh, the Scottish Government has previously conceded that, that there are circumstances where this Parliament will consent to Brexit-related UK primary legislation, such as the Healthcare Arrangements Bill. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that there may be scenarios in the next few months where a similar situation may occur and that, that it will be in the national interest for this Parliament to consent to UK Government Brexit legislation? Cabinet Secretary. I'm not entirely sure that you and I would, the, the, Mr Cameron and I would agree on the definition of the national interest, but let that pass. Um, I, I do agree with Mr Cameron that there may be circumstances in which it is the right thing to bring forward partial or complete legislative consent motions. We did it in the healthcare arrangements bill because I think it was utterly wrong. Although I, in the end, I don't think the individuals would have suffered. There was a potential for individuals and vulnerable individuals to suffer. And I think it was the right thing for this government to say we will make an exception in this case. What we're not going to be do, done is to be bludgeoned, bullied, or frightened into doing the wrong thing. As I was uh, delivering my statement, uh, some people may not have heard, the microphones may not have picked it up, but Mr Tompkins spent his time uh, shouting uh, remarks about voting for the Prime Minister's deal. That's right. That would be the utterly wrong thing to do. Yeah. And to give legislative consent to a withdrawal bill, which is the utterly wrong thing, will not happen. I mean, I certainly will recommend to this chamber that that doesn't happen. But I don't want people individually to suffer, as in the healthcare bill, and 
if there, there are circumstances where that's the case, then I hope I will make the right decision on that, and I respect Mr Cameron for raising it. Stuart McWillan to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm saying also, with the increased likelihood of a no-deal Brexit uh, following last week's vote, can the Scottish Government say what clarity it's, just, it's actually had from the UK Government on post-Brexit funding, especially funding to replace current EU funding which supports jobs, infrastructure, research and also sustaining our rural communities? There is no clarity on replacement funding. There are some guarantees in place in terms of continuation funding, for example, in the agriculture sector, but those are limited, and the closer you look at them, uh, the, the more insubstantial they become. So what we have tried to do is to make it clear that where those guarantees exist, we will honour them, providing we're funded to honour them. But in the wider issues, then there, is, there are no such guarantees, and that is very concerning. For example, infrastructure funding, which would be of enormous importance to the Highlands and Islands, has dried up completely. Uh, money availability from the European uh, Investment Bank has dried up completely. Uh, if you look at the uh, potential for new schemes under this so-called Shared Prosperity Fund, which is a regional fund that's going to be run from London, which seems a bit of a bit of a contradiction. We know virtually nothing about how this will actually operate. There was meant to be a consultation on it at the end of last year. It hasn't taken place. So we would like to know what the proposals are. Even better, we'd like to be part of the discussion as to how these things should move forward. But we simply, but we simply do not get the answers in these circumstances. Amy Green to be followed by Keith Brown. Thank you, Sorry, no, sir. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, made a statement saying that it remains of concern uh, to him that so many small businesses have not yet engaged in sufficient uh, Brexit planning. Can I ask if he has a, a sense of the scale of how many businesses have not yet engaged in any form of preparedness, why he thinks that might be given the prominence of Brexit in, in politics at the moment, and what he feels that both he, his government, but all of us as MSPs could do to better signpost our own local businesses uh, towards some of that excellent joint agency resource that is available to them, including some of the many excellent events that they're hosting right across Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. I, I certainly think that each individual member should know their own constituencies or regions, should know how to contact small businesses, should be in the local newspapers encouraging that to happen. As for an es estimate of number of businesses, I, I really would have to rely on, for example, the Chancellor, who has indicated that uh, vast numbers of small businesses have not yet uh, taken this up. I think the experience is true across these islands, regrettably. Um, and I think that is uh, for a number of reasons. I indicated normal, say, bias. People don't believe that the government could be as incompetent as the Tory government is and are now waking up to the fact that it could be as incompetent as that. But if members have the ability to talk to others and to, to talk to small businesses, please use it and make sure they use the resources that are available. Keith Brown to be followed by James Kelly. Access to European structural and social funds has been a very important source of additional resources for my constituency. Indeed, uh, since the Thatcher government in the 80s slashed regional aid to the north of England, Scotland and Wales. Uh, for example, in Clubmanager, it's helped to support economic development, job creation and trading to the tune of £1.13 million since 2014. Can the Cabinet Secretary therefore provide any update as to whether this vital funding in my constituency will be continued after Brexit and advise, and I think I know the answer to this, if the UK government has provided any information, given we've only got 38 days to go, as to whether the Shared Prosperity Fund will replace these resources? The second part is no, we have no such information, but I think the member is absolutely right to stress the importance of these funds. In the current 2014 to 2020 programme, uh, there's already been £480 million committed to projects across Scotland. I would just ask members to, to think of the circumstances in which, uh, let's say, in the next six years, £480 million was abstracted from the Scottish economy because there was money not available to do so. So I think we are in a very serious situation. I know that member speaks for his constituency, which has received £1.13 million in that programme. There are many constituencies who have actually received more. It is vital we know what is happening, but we have heard no more about it, largely going to the complete chaos uh, in the Westminster Government. James Kelly to be followed by Angela Constance. Thank you. The Cabinet Secretary has outlined how the Government has made representations to the UK Government in relation to uh, funding required to meet the costs of EU exit. Uh, if the full costs of that funding uh, are not met by the UK Government, what contingency planning has the Government, Scottish Government, put in place to deal with that, uh, that scenario. Cabinet Secretary. Um, 
the memory raises a, an important point, I have to say. Uh, you know, the, the Scottish Government is very limited in its, its ability to, to produce new resources. And if money is not provided, then it becomes a choice of whether we are able to spend it or we are not able to spend it. In the circumstances of a no-deal Brexit, I think we would feel an imperative to do everything that we possibly could. But we could find ourselves very short of resources to do so. Now, that's why my, my colleague, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, is pushing us as you were the Chief Secretary to the, to the Treasury, amongst others. There needs to be that sort of commitment, but that commitment has not been entered into. I think this will be... Um, is sort of a day at a time issue. We will have to continue to spend money to do the things we need to do were we to find ourselves in those circumstances and to continue to pressure the UK government. The UK government did indicate that in the event of a no deal there would be a supplementary budget. Uh, we would be very clear that we would require to have a substantial resource made available within that supplementary budget to do the jobs we had to do. Angela Constance to be followed by Rachel Hamilton. Thank you, President Officer. Cabinet Secretary, Patterson Aaron are an award-winning food and drink company and employ 200 people, providing much-needed employment in my constituency. They have written to me in detail about their concerns about the, I quote, catastrophic consequences of Brexit, uh, given the impact on their cost base, supply chain, delays at ports, etc. Uh, therefore, will Mr Russell and or Mr Ewan uh, visit Patterson Arm to discuss their concerns and what more can be done to support this small but key manufacturer in our food and drink industry? Cabinet Secretary. I'm sure Mr Ewing would be happy to visit and so would I. I mean, the origins of this company are, are, are fascinating and it's a company that's been in existence for, in, in its earliest incarnations for over a, a hundred years. I think it was founded in, in 1896, the Patterson part of it. Uh, it is world renowned for its shortbread, for its oat cakes uh, and the Aran brand, of course, in terms of preserves and chutneys. And it will present an enormous problem if this uh, uh, chain of, of export and production is interrupted. So Mr Ewing, who is, he tells me, undertaking taking a food resilience uh, teleconference within 10 minutes uh, will, I'm sure, come back to you about visiting and I'd be happy to, to do so as well and to, um, might I suggest, sample the oat cakes. Rachel Hamilton to be followed by Jenny Gilbert. Thank you. The UK government gave Derek Mackay 92 million in funding to prepare for leaving the EU. In England, the funding was passed on to local authorities. In Scotland, it was not. Why not? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm sorry, I dispute that uh, account. I, I know that some people have said that. I, I dispute that. I have met with COSLA. Uh, I continue to meet with COSLA. I'll be seeing COSLA again later this week. Uh, we recognise that they will have a requirement for funding. And in these circumstances, we will work with COSLA to make sure that, that funding flows from the UK government. And of course, one of the differences in this, and um, uh, Rachel Hamilton uh, just needs to think about this for a moment, there is a direct line from the UK government to local authorities. But in Scotland, there is a direct line from the UK government to the Scottish government. Uh, and if they want to have a direct line to local authorities, well, that's a discussion to have. But the routes for money are different. We will ensure that we assist the local, local government as much as we can. But I do think, presiding officer, it is very rich for a Tory to criticise lack of funding to local government, given, A, their attitude to the budget in this place, and secondly, their attitude to Brexit, particularly from a Brexiteer, an original Brexiteer, I believe, um, like Rachel Hammond. Or was, are you a born, is she a born-again Brexiteer? Uh, did you originally espouse Brexit, or does she, has she come to Brexit? Uh, new form. Whatever it is, it's pretty rich anyway. Jenny Gilruth to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, has the Scottish Government considered commissioning an equalities impact assessment on the UK Government's uh, settled status fee, given that the payment of £65 for those over 16, which, whilst now refundable, remains in place, and that people are being forced to travel from places like Glenrothes in my constituency to Edinburgh to register for the scheme at personal cost? Cabinet Secretary. I understand that the travelling is required for document upload if the app uh, does not uh, upload documents, and that is unacceptable, and the technological history of this uh, matter is a pretty sad one. In terms of the fee, I'm very glad that the fee has now um, uh, disappeared. It, it is an extraordinary thing for a government to say, here's a fee, you're going to pay it, and then to celebrate when they actually abolish the fee themselves. <laughs> it is quite extraordinary, uh, but I'm glad it's gone. But even so, it should never have come in the first place. There's a wider issue around this, which is how do we say to EU nationals, we need you here. It's not a, it's not a question simply of being nice to people. The Scottish economy needs the presence yep. of EU nationals. 
People have chosen to make their home here. And I want to hear that from the Conservative benches. I don't want to hear Brexit from the Conservative benches. There's lots of people doing that. I want to hear them saying, stay to the EU nationals, instead of pandering, instead of pandering to the hard right within their party, which is all that they're presently doing. John McAlpine. Thank you. The Tory Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson caused great offence when he suggested a post-Brexit Britain would use lethal force and threaten to park a new aircraft carrier in China's backyard. The Financial Times reports that this has resulted in UK trade talks in Beijing being cancelled. What effect does the Cabinet Secretary believe Mr Williamson's speech has had on Scotland's trading relationship with China? Cabinet Secretary. Well, if, if anybody is, is listening uh, from Beijing or elsewhere, I, I would want them to know that the Scottish Parliament uh, has no interest in supporting Gavin Williamson. He is a comic opera figure. Uh, he is the private pike of the, uh, of the UK <laughs> government. And his, his speech was nonsensical. It also used words that weren't in the English language. But he, it is completely nonsensical. And, and, but for a, speech to have, for a speech to have that effect, it shows that we are dealing with people who have no sense of how a government should operate. The real tragedy, presiding officer, is as I'm saying that, there are words of support for Gavin Williamson coming from the Tory benches. They are so out of touch with what is happening, not just in Scotland, not just in the UK, but in the world, that really it is time they step back and, as my old granny said, take a jump to themselves. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that concludes our statement this afternoon, and we're going to move on shortly to our next item of business, which will be a debate on motion 15879 in the name of Derek Mackay on the Scottish Rate Resolution. We'll just take a few moments, a few seconds, a few moments anyway, to, uh, for the Minister and members to change seats.